Want to speak real Arabic from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at arabicpod101.com. How are your Arabic listening skills? First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. Are you ready? رجل وامرأة يتحدثان بينما يشاهدان اقتراع بشأن مواد الأطفال المفضلة. أي مخطط يبين النتيجة للأطفال في سن الخامسة عشر؟ انظري إلى هذا المقال. إنه عن المواد الثلاث الأكثر شعبية بين الأطفال في سن العاشرة إلى الخامسة عشر. آه، دعني أرى. آه، التدريب البدني في قمة قائمة الأطفال في سن العاشرة. التدريب البدني ما زال ذو شعبية. وسمعت أيضا أن الأطفال في هذه الأيام يقضون وقتا أقل بممارسة الرياضة. نعم، والموسيقى تأتي ثانيا. نعم، المادة الأكثر شعبية بين الأطفال في سن الخامسة عشر هي التاريخ. عندما تصبح في سن الخامسة عشر، تصبح مهتما بمواد مختلفة عن سن العاشرة. صحيح. آه، السياسة تأتي ثانيا، وتكنولوجيا المعلومات تأتي في المرتبة الثالثة. ولكنها لم تكن حتى مادة عندما كنا في ذلك العمر. بالمناسبة، ماذا كانت المادة الثالثة الأكثر شعبية للأطفال في سن العاشرة؟ دعنا نرى. آه، الفنون. أتساءل ما إذا كانوا يصممون أشياء باستخدام برامج الحاسوب؟ أي مخطط يبين النتيجة للأطفال في سن الخامسة عشر؟ رجل وامرأة يتحدثان بينما يشاهدان اقتراع بشأن مواد الأطفال المفضلة. أي مخطط يبين النتيجة للأطفال في سن الخامسة عشر؟ انظري إلى هذا المقال. إنه عن المواد الثلاث الأكثر شعبية بين الأطفال في سن العاشرة إلى الخامسة عشر. آه. دعني أرى آه، التدريب البدني في قمة قائمة الأطفال في سن العاشرة التدريب البدني ما زال ذو شعبية وسمعت أيضا أن الأطفال في هذه الأيام يقضون وقتا أقل بممارسة الرياضة نعم والموسيقى تأتي ثانيا نعم المادة الأكثر شعبية بين الأطفال في سن الخامسة عشر هي التاريخ عندما تصبح في سن الخامسة عشر تصبح مهتما بمواد مختلفة عن سن العاشرة صحيح آه السياسة تأتي ثانيا وتكنولوجيا المعلومات تأتي في المرتبة الثالثة ولكنها لم تكن حتى مادة عندما كنا في ذلك العمر بالمناسبة ماذا كانت المادة الثالثة الأكثر شعبية للأطفال في سن العاشرة؟ دعنا نرى آه، الفنون أتساءل ما إذا كانوا يصممون أشياء باستخدام برامج الحاسوب Did you get it right? I hope you learned something from this quiz Let us know if you have any questions See you next time Welcome to Introduction to Arabic. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined by... Hi everyone, I'm Yafa. In this series, you will learn everything you need to know to get started learning Arabic. That's right, and we are here to help guide you on your journey. In this lesson, you'll learn the reasons why you should start learning a new language, why you should learn Arabic in particular, and how to get started. There are countless reasons, but perhaps the biggest one of all is that it could actually change your life. Learning a new language unlocks new pathways that are off-limits to you now. 
There are certain things that you simply cannot do without having the technical or cultural skills that come from learning a new language. Like working or living in another country. Knowing another language provides you with greater job opportunities. You have the freedom to move to another country halfway around the world and be able to earn a living, or even better yet, build a career from it, instead of just being stuck in one place. Language allows you to visit or live in places that you may never even have considered going, simply because that wasn't a possibility for you. Knowing another language simply gives you more options to choose from. And learning a new language also helps you to be more open-minded and see the world from a new perspective. Language and culture go hand in hand. The world is a big place, and by broadening your understanding of other cultures, it allows you to be more empathetic and understanding of the many different ways that people live their lives. With language, you're able to see and experience more, which helps you to grow as a person. Learning a new language also improves your memory. Several studies have consistently shown that those who study another language have improved memory as opposed to those who didn't learn another language. Learning another language also keeps your brain healthy by significantly delaying the onset of Alzheimer's and dementia. This difference can be as much as four to five more years of quality life. And those are just some of the reasons you should learn another language. The list just goes on and on. Now you know the benefits of studying another language, but why should you learn Arabic in particular? The Arab world is well known as a ceaseless supply of oil. It's rich in resources with enormous oil and natural gas reserves. In fact, seven of the top 20 countries that produce the most oil come from Arab nations. Not to mention that Arabic is spoken in more than 20 countries with roughly 300 million native speakers worldwide. This makes Arabic one of the most widely spoken languages in the world. Knowing Arabic opens up many business and career opportunities. The region's instability has not affected its tourism industry, which is considered the fastest growing sector in the region, with Egypt, UAE, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan leading the way. Surely you have heard of the ancient pyramids of Giza or the Burj Khalifa. Well, these are both famous attractions in the Arab world, where Arabic is the official language. The majority of the Arabian population can't speak English, so if you're planning on making a few friends in any Arab country, being able to speak Arabic is an absolute must. Another sector that is growing steadily in the Arab world is telecommunications. Within less than a decade, many local companies have managed to successfully compete internationally as global players. Islam is the most widespread religion in the Arab world, and it serves as a framework through which many Arabs see the world. Through your study of Arabic, you will pick up knowledge of Islamic traditions and beliefs that will introduce you to a new religion, or to gain insight into the second largest religion in the world. So clearly, there are many, many reasons why you should learn Arabic. Okay then, we've talked about the reasons you should learn Arabic, but how should they get started, Yafa? Well, it's as simple as learning your first word in Arabic and building up from there. The fact that will surprise you is that you already know some Arabic. Al-Kuhul, Laymoon, Sukkar. Many English words have been acquired directly from Arabic, or else indirectly by passing from Arabic into other languages and then into English. So you must have said some Arabic words before. Let's teach you something that is very useful. All Arabic vocabulary is made up of root consonants that you can easily memorize. Can you explain this further, Yafa? Sure, Alicia. For example, there are loads of words derived from the three letters kef, te, be, which are equivalent to the English letters k, t, and b. And they are all connected in some way to writing. The verb ketebe, which means he wrote, ketibun, which means writer, kitabun, which means book, and so on. To better understand this point, we'll compare it to English. In English, we have many words derived from the same three letters. For example, run, runner, and running are all derived from the three letters R, U, N, and the three words are related to each other. It's the same thing in Arabic. You see the similarity in all of those words, don't you? All of those words come from the same three letters. So even if you only memorize the three letters K, T, and B, you could, in many cases, take a really good guess at the meaning of a word, since you know it has something to do with books and writing. Exactly. That makes things much easier to learn. 
Well, you'll learn more about Arabic writing in episode 4, so stay tuned. Now, try saying your first word in Arabic. Listen and repeat after Yafa. Shukran. Now your turn. Shukran. Try it again. Shukran. Well done. You just learned how to say thank you in Arabic. We've covered a lot of things already, so why don't we wrap up the first lesson and recap on what we've learned. In this lesson, you learn the benefits of studying Arabic. The Arab world has a colorful history with many things for you to see and learn. And to say thank you in Arabic, it's... Shukran. In the next lesson, we're going to demystify Arabic pronunciation by taking a look at the sounds of Arabic. So be sure to watch the next video. See you in the next lesson. Bye. Bye. Hi. Welcome to Introduction to Arabic. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined by... Hi, everyone. I'm Yafa. In this lesson, you'll learn the basics of Arabic pronunciation. Pronunciation refers to the manner in which a word is spoken, so don't focus on reading what's on screen. Instead, focus on listening and repeating. Arabic is what is called a stress-timed language. This simply means that stressed syllables are valued more than unstressed syllables. Stressed syllables will be pronounced louder and longer than unstressed syllables, which are shortened to accommodate the rhythm of stressed syllables. Kitab. Kitab. Notice that the second syllable is stressed. It's pronounced longer and louder, while the first and final syllables are shortened. Kitab. If you think about it, this is identical to English. Opportunity. The stressed syllable to in opportunity is deemed more important, so it's pronounced longer than all other syllables. Listen to it again. Opportunity. Compare this once again with Arabic. Kitab. Opportunity. Kitab. Opportunity. Kitab. As you can see, the timing and rhythm of Arabic isn't much different than that of English. Despite what you may think, Arabic pronunciation is actually quite similar to English. There are more familiar sounds between English and Arabic than unfamiliar sounds. In fact, 75% of all sounds in Arabic exist in English, too. This means that if you were to simply imitate an Arabic speaker, your pronunciation will be correct roughly 75% of the time. Repeat after me. Al-Mudir. Al-Mudir. Chances are, your pronunciation was pretty spot on. The A, L, M, U, D, I, and R sounds are practically identical to English. Try again. Al-Mudir. Nearly all sounds in Arabic are identical to English, similar to the consonant sounds in this example. Since you already know how to pronounce most of these sounds, we only need to pay attention to the handful of sounds that are unique to Arabic. They're the ones we need to look out for. Of all the sounds that exist in Arabic, there are roughly nine new consonant sounds that you need to practice. Ha, ra, sa, va, ta, va, ka, ra, ha. These five sounds are known as emphatic consonants. They're categorized as such because they're pronounced deep within the throat. Va, ha, sa, va, ka. They sound like the D, H, S, T, and Q sounds respectively, except much more tense because the throat is constricted. Listen again. Va, ha, sa, va, ka. Let's take a look at another sound that's quite distinctively Arabic. Consider the phrase for good morning in Arabic. Sabah al khair. Sabah al khair. The letter Kha is a sound that's often used in Arabic, between AK and NH sound. Kha. It sounds as though you're clearing your throat. Kha. We'll cover this sound and all other sounds in Arabic in much more detail in future lessons. For now, let's close this lesson by recapping what we've learned. In this lesson, you learned that Arabic is a stress-timed language, where the rhythm is akin to English. Collectively, nearly all sounds in Arabic are identical to the sounds of English, and there are only a handful of new sounds that you need to learn. Hi! 
Welcome to Introduction to Arabic. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined by... Hi everyone, I'm Yafa. In this lesson, you'll learn the basics of Arabic grammar. Word order refers to the order in which words are structured to form a sentence in a given language. Consider the English sentence, I ate an apple. But first, let's remove the article an here for simplicity. So we're just left with, I ate apple. The basic word order for English is subject, verb, object, or SVO for short. If we break down the English sentence, I ate apple, we can see that the subject I is presented first, followed by the verb ate, and then finally, the object apple is positioned last. This is the basic word order for sentences in English. Now, let's compare that same sentence, I ate an apple, in Arabic. Akaltu ana tufaha. If we break down the Arabic sentence, we get the verb akaltu, which means ate, followed by the subject ana, meaning I. And finally, we have the object tufaha, meaning apple. Arabic is actually written in red from right to left. We will cover this aspect more in the next episode on writing. The word order for Arabic then is verb, subject, object, or VSO for short. The same sentence in Arabic then is essentially ate, I, apple. Verb first, then subject and object last. Okay, let's move on to the next section. English is what is called a subject prominent language. This simply means that the subject is slightly more important than other components in the sentence. It's the key piece of information other components in the sentence relate to. Who is doing the action is slightly more important than what is being done or which object it's been done to in English. Arabic, on the other hand, is defined as a null subject language. That essentially means that the subject isn't valued as much in Arabic as it is in English. In fact, Arabic speakers would likely omit the subject from a sentence altogether wherever they can. Such as when the subject was about you, the speaker, or if the subject has already been established and you're just continuing the conversation. Let's take a look at this phenomenon on null subject in a bit more detail. More often than not, if you wanted to say, I ate an apple, in Arabic, you would not say, Ekaltu ana tofeha. Instead, you would more likely say, ate apple, in Arabic. Akaltu tofeha, where you omit the subject I. Most Arabic sentences are constructed and spoken like this in real life. Akaltu tofeha. In most situations, such as a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's clear that the person who's speaking is the subject. In cases where it's obvious who or what the subject is, it's almost guaranteed that the subject will be omitted. And so you're left with... Akaltu tofeha. On the other hand, when it's unclear who or what the subject is, or if you wanted to place emphasis on the subject, like if you wanted to declare from a group of people that it was you who ate the apple, then you would include the subject. Akaltu ana tofeha. But more often than not, most sentences spoken in daily Arabic conversation can be spoken without including the subject at all, particularly if that subject is you. Knowing this, we can easily express any simple action in Arabic using just the object and the verb. Try to create the sentence, I ate a hot dog, from this set of words. Akaltu hot dog. Okay, got it? So we know the verb order of Arabic is VSO. The verb goes first, so let's put ate here. Next would come the subject, but as we learned earlier, we can afford to ignore the subject since the speaker is the same person taking action. Finally, we can add the object hot dog at the end there. And that's it. Akaltu hot dog. You just learned how to say, I ate a hot dog in Arabic. Well done. Akaltu hot dog. You can create any basic sentence like this in Arabic if you simply know the word for the verb and the object in Arabic. Let's wrap up this lesson by recapping what you've learned. In this lesson, you learned that Arabic sentences are formed using a verb, subject, object, or VSO word order. 
Most sentences spoken in Arabic will not actually contain a subject, especially if that subject is obvious, like when it's you, yourself, the speaker. And lastly, you can create basic sentences in Arabic by putting the verb first and the object last. How are your Arabic listening skills? First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. Are you ready? رجل وامرأة يتحدثان. كم عمر الرجل الآن؟ عيد ميلادك قريب جدا. نعم، إنه بعد غد. كم سيصبح عمرك؟ سوف يصبح ستين سنة. مبروك، لنحتفل. شكرا جزيلا لك، أنا ممتن جدا. كم عمر الرجل الآن؟ رجل وامرأة يتحدثان كم عمر الرجل الآن؟ عيد ميلادك قريب جدا نعم، إنه بعد غد كم سيصبح عمرك؟ سوف يصبح ستين سنة مبروك، لنحتفل شكرا جزيلا لك، أنا ممتن جدا. رجل وامرأة يتحدثان. من يعيش مع الرجل؟ لماذا لا تأتي إلى منزلي في وقت لاحق؟ شكرا لك، ولكنني أشعر بالتوتر قليلا. أريد أن أعرف عن عائلتك قبل مقابلتهم. بالطبع، أبي عامل مكتب. وهوايته صيد السمك أمي ربة منزل وهي ماهرة بالطبخ هل لديك أي إخوة أو أخوات؟ نعم، لدي أخت كبيرة وأخ صغير أختي متزوجة وتعيش في الخارج أخي طالب في المدرسة الثانوية لديك عائلة لطيفة قد أحب أن ألتقي بهم وأتحدث معهم من يعيش مع الرجل؟ رجل وامرأة يتحدثان من يعيش مع الرجل؟ لماذا لا تأتي إلى منزلي في وقت لاحق؟ شكرا لك، ولكنني أشعر بالتوتر قليلا أريد أن أعرف عن عائلتك قبل مقابلتهم بالطبع، أبي عامل مكتب وهوايته صيد السمك أمي ربة منزل وهي ماهرة بالطبخ هل لديك أي إخوة أو أخوات؟ نعم، لدي أخت كبيرة وأخ صغير أختي متزوجة وتعيش في الخارج أخي طالب في المدرسة الثانوية لديك عائلة لطيفة قد أحب أن ألتقي بهم وأتحدث معهم رجل يتصل بمطعم على الهاتف في أي وقت سوف يغلق المطعم؟ لو سمحت، حتى أي وقت تفتحون؟ نحن نفتح حتى الساعة الحادية عشر مساء ولكن آخر طلب سيكون في الساعة العاشرة آه، هذا جيد ظننت أنكم أغلقتم لأن الوقت متأخر لقد اعتدنا على الإغلاق في الساعة العاشرة، ولكننا مددنا الوقت. آه، فهمت. لكننا نغلق المطعم في الساعة التاسعة في أيام الأحد. حسناً، فهمت. في أي وقت سوف يغلق المطعم؟ رجل يتصل بمطعم على الهاتف. في أي وقت سوف يغلق المطعم؟ لو سمحت، حتى أي وقت تفتحون؟ نحن نفتح حتى الساعة الحادية عشر مساء، ولكن آخر طلب سيكون في الساعة العاشرة. آه، هذا جيد. ظننت أنكم أغلقتم، لأن الوقت متأخر. لقد اعتدنا على الإغلاق في الساعة العاشرة، ولكننا مددنا الوقت. آه، فهمت. لكننا نغلق المطعم في الساعة التاسعة في أيام الأحد حسناً، فهمت
امرأة تسأل عن نظام تداول المواد في المكتبة كم عدد المواد التي تستطيع أن تستعيرها في مرة واحدة؟ لو سمحت، هل تستطيع أن تريني كيفية استعارة الكتب؟ هل هي المرة الأولى التي تستعملين هذه المكتبة؟ نعم حسناً إذن، سوف أشرح لك القوانين في هذه المكتبة تستطيعين أن تستعيري حتى ستة كتب وخمسة سيديات أو ديفيديات للشخص الواحد ولكن يمكنك أن تستعيري حتى عشرة مواد في المجموع مدة الاستعارة هي أسبوعين وإذا كنت تريدين أن تمددي الفترة أرجو التجديد قبل انتهاء الفترة هل أستطيع أن أستعير المجلات والجرائد؟ تستطيعين استعارة الجرائد ولكن المجلات متاحة باستثناء الإصدار الأخير هل أستطيع إعادتها بالبريد؟ لا نستطيع أن نقبل الإعادة بالبريد أرجوك تعالي إلى المكتبة لإعادتهم وبعد ساعات العمل يمكنك وضعهم في صندوق الإعادة الذي بجانب المدخل ولكن لا تستعمل صندوق الإعادة إذا كانت المواد متأخرة فهمت، شكرا جزيلا لك كم عدد المواد التي تستطيع أن تستعيرها في مرة واحدة؟ امرأة تسأل عن نظام تداول المواد في المكتبة كم عدد المواد التي تستطيع أن تستعيرها في مرة واحدة؟ لو سمحت، هل تستطيع أن تريني كيفية استعارة الكتب؟ هل هي المرة الأولى التي تستعملين هذه المكتبة؟ نعم حسناً إذن، سوف أشرح لك القوانين في هذه المكتبة تستطيعين أن تستعيري حتى ستة كتب وخمسة سيديات أو ديفيديات للشخص الواحد ولكن يمكنك أن تستعيري حتى عشرة مواد في المجموع مدة الاستعارة هي أسبوعين وإذا كنت تريدين أن تمددي الفترة أرجو التجديد قبل انتهاء الفترة هل أستطيع أن أستعير المجلات والجرائد؟ تستطيعين استعارة الجرائد ولكن المجلات متاحة باستثناء الإصدار الأخير هل أستطيع إعادتها بالبريد؟ لا نستطيع أن نقبل الإعادة بالبريد أرجوك تعالي إلى المكتبة لإعادتهم وبعد ساعات العمل يمكنك وضعهم في صندوق الإعادة الذي بجانب المدخل ولكن لا تستعمل صندوق الإعادة إذا كانت المواد متأخرة فهمت، شكرا جزيلا لك طالب وطالبة يتكلمان بينما ينظران إلى جدول صفهم اختر جدول الطالب ليوم الاجتماع يجب علينا الاجتماع من أجل عرض الفريق القادم هذا صحيح متى أنت متفرغ؟ أنا آتي إلى المدرسة أيام الاثنين والأربعاء والخميس إذا الأربعاء أو الخميس سيكون جيدا بالنسبة لنا نحن الاثنين في حين أني آتي إلى المدرسة أيام الثلاثاء والأربعاء والخميس ماذا عن الخميس بعد الظهر؟ آه الخميس لدي محاضرات حتى الحصة الثالثة نستطيع أن نفعلها بعد الحصة الثالثة صف الاقتصاد ولكن لدي عمل من الساعة الخامسة لذلك سأكون متوفرا لساعة واحدة مم. هذا يبدو قصيرا بعض الشيء ماذا عن الأربعاء إذا؟ باستثناء التاريخ المعاصر في الحصة الثانية والقانون الدولي في الحصة الرابعة أنا متفرغ فهمت لدي التاريخ الآسيوي في الحصة الثالثة ولدي عمل في المساء ما رأيك بالالتقاء في الصباح والتكلم قبل الحصة الثانية؟ حسناً أنا لست برجل يستيقظ باكراً لماذا لا نلتقي يوم الخميس؟ سوف أعيد جدولة عملي ليوم آخر حسناً تعال إلى المقصف عندما ينتهي الدرس
اختر جدول الطالب ليوم الاجتماع طالب وطالبة يتكلمان بينما ينظران إلى جدول صفهم اختر جدول الطالب ليوم الاجتماع يجب علينا الاجتماع من أجل عرض الفريق القادم هذا صحيح متى أنت متفرق؟ أنا آتي إلى المدرسة أيام الاثنين والأربعاء والخميس إذا الأربعاء أو الخميس سيكون جيدا بالنسبة لنا نحن الاثنين في حين أني آتي إلى المدرسة أيام الثلاثاء والأربعاء والخميس ماذا عن الخميس بعد الظهر؟ آه الخميس لدي محاضرات حتى الحصة الثالثة نستطيع أن نفعلها بعد الحصة الثالثة صف الاقتصاد ولكن لدي عمل من الساعة الخامسة لذلك سأكون متوفرا لساعة واحدة مم. هذا يبدو قصيرا بعض الشيء ماذا عن الأربعاء إذا؟ باستثناء التاريخ المعاصر في الحصة الثانية والقانون الدولي في الحصة الرابعة أنا متفرغ فهمت لدي التاريخ الآسيوي في الحصة الثالثة ولدي عمل في المساء ما رأيك بالالتقاء في الصباح والتكلم قبل الحصة الثانية؟ حسنا أنا لست برجل يستيقظ باكرا لماذا لا نلتقي يوم الخميس؟ سوف أعيد جدولة عملي ليوم آخر حسنا تعال إلى المقصف عندما ينتهي الدرس تلفاز يبث التوقعات الجوية أيهم التوقع الجوي للأسبوع القادم؟ ها هي التوقعات الجوية للأسبوع القادم في النصف الأول من هذا الأسبوع معظم الأيام ستكون مشمسة في الإجمال وقد يكون الجو غائما من وقت إلى آخر في النصف الثاني من الأسبوع ستنتشر الغيوم وستمطر في بعض المناطق في منتصف الأسبوع عندما يبدأ الجو بالاستياء سيكون هناك مناطق حيث سيسوء الجو كثيرا أعلى درجة حرارة ستكون كالمعدل السنوي وسترتفع إلى عشرين درجة في النصف الأول من الأسبوع ولكن بعد ذلك ستكون منخفضة عن المعدل وستكون بين ثمانية عشر إلى خمسة عشر درجة أوطى درجة حرارة ستكون بين سبع إلى ثماني درجات والتي أوطى بقليل من الطبيعي سيكون يوم الأحد غدا مشمسا وسيكون جوا مثاليا للعطلة أيهم؟ التوقع الجوي للأسبوع القادم تلفاز يبث التوقعات الجوية أيهم التوقع الجوي للأسبوع القادم؟ ها هي التوقعات الجوية للأسبوع القادم في النصف الأول من هذا الأسبوع معظم الأيام ستكون مشمسة في الإجمال وقد يكون الجو غائما من وقت إلى آخر في النصف الثاني من الأسبوع ستنتشر الغيوم وستمطر في بعض المناطق في منتصف الأسبوع عندما يبدأ الجو بالاستياء سيكون هناك مناطق حيث سيسوء الجو كثيرا أعلى درجة حرارة ستكون كالمعدل السنوي وسترتفع إلى عشرين درجة في النصف الأول من الأسبوع ولكن بعد ذلك ستكون منخفضة عن المعدل وستكون بين ثمانية عشر إلى خمسة عشر درجة أوطى درجة حرارة ستكون بين سبع إلى ثمانية درجات والتي أوطى بقليل من الطبيعي 
سيكون يوم الأحد غدا مشمسا وسيكون جوا مثاليا للعطلة Did you get it right? I hope you learned something from this quiz. Let us know if you have any questions. See you next time. Want to speak real Arabic from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at arabicpod101.com. Hi everyone. Do you know how to say I love you in Arabic? In this lesson, you'll learn three different ways to say it. Let's start with how to express your feelings to your loved one. أنا أحبك أنا أحبك أنا أحبك Or, if you want to explain those butterflies in your stomach, you can say أنا معجب بك أنا معجب بك أنا معجب بك And when you feel that I love you is not enough, you can say لا يمكن للكلمات أن تصف حبي لك لا يمكن للكلمات أن تصف حبي لك لا يمكن للكلمات أن تصف حبي لك Hi everybody, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com And welcome to our new series, Ask an Arabic Teacher. In this series, I'm going to be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, which dialect of Arabic should I learn or focus on? The variant of Arabic you should learn depends on your goals and what you want to achieve using your knowledge of Arabic. If you want to learn Arabic to become a professional translator, work in politics, read newspapers, or write reports for work, then you should definitely focus on modern standard Arabic. On the other hand, if you want to be able to communicate with Arabic-speaking people, you have to learn a popular dialect that's widely understood, like Egyptian Arabic or Levantine Arabic. As Nelson Mandela once said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. And let's get the facts straight. Nobody speaks modern standard Arabic in their daily conversations. not to one person in the whole entire world. To understand the difference in usage between modern standard Arabic and dialects, you need to know what modern standard Arabic and dialects mean to Arabic-speaking people. Babies learn the dialect of their country or region first to communicate with their parents. Then, when they go to school, they start learning how to read and write modern standard Arabic, because this is what they will use to read textbooks, take exams, read books and newspapers. They will learn it from kindergarten up to the end of high school. But depending on their major, they might take more modern standard Arabic courses throughout their college years. For example, if their major is translation or journalism, they will continue taking classes because that's what the news, the formal and legal papers is written in. Other than that, social media, speaking with professors, co-workers, teachers, friends, and family is all in dialect. That's why the average Arabic-speaking person might make a lot of mistakes when trying to use modern standard Arabic. Even Arabic speakers need a lot of proofreading when they're writing a very important document. What about choosing between dialects then? Variants of Arabic dialects sound pretty different from each other. They're almost like a different language. Choosing the dialect to study, of course, has to do with the region of the Arabic-speaking world you're interested in. But you should keep another factor in mind. Some dialects are easier to learn and pronounce depending on your native language. For instance, I noticed that Levantine dialects are easier to learn than Egyptian dialect if your native language is Japanese. That's because of similarities in rhythm and phonemes. So listening to different dialects is a good way to get a feel of how they sound before you make up your mind. Keep in mind, though, that the most widely understood Arabic dialects are Egyptian Arabic and Levantine Arabic. because of how popular their media is in the Arabic-speaking countries. I hope you liked our lesson. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below, and I will see you in the next episode. Salam! Hi! Welcome to Introduction to Arabic. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined by... Hi everyone! I'm Yafa. In this lesson, you'll learn the basics of Arabic writing. 
First, let's introduce you to the Arabic alphabet. The Arabic alphabet consists of 28 letters. There are three vowels. Alif, Wa, Ya. The rest are consonants. Ba, Ta, Tha, Jim, Dal, Ra, Za, and so on. Five consonant letters are emphatic or hard versions of other letters. They're pronounced deeper in the throat. Vad, Ha, Saad, Va, Qaf. Let's talk a little bit about the sequence that they are written in. Just like how English orders its alphabet in A, B, C, and so forth, there is a proper order in which Arabic letters are sequenced too. There are actually two ways the Arabic alphabet is ordered. One is called Abjad and the other Hija. For this introductory lesson, just understand that Abjad is the older version while the Hija is the newer version that's commonly used in modern day dictionaries. So if you had to choose, try to learn the newer version. Hija. Just like how there are Abjad and Hija orders, of the Arabic alphabet, there are also two different styles of writing in Arabic. The first is classical Arabic, the language of the Quran, in the classical literature. It differs from the other type of written Arabic in style and vocabulary, some of which is abandoned now. The second is modern standard Arabic, the universal language of the Arabic-speaking world, which is understood by all Arabic speakers. It's the language of the vast majority of written material and of formal TV shows, lectures, and so on. Once again, you can think of them as the old and the newer style. The biggest difference between these two writing styles is that Classical Arabic represents vowels, while Modern Standard Arabic mostly does not. Let's try to draw a comparison to English to better demonstrate this point. Take, for example, a word like cover in English. It's written C-O-V-E-R. This is how you would write it in Classical Arabic. In modern standard Arabic, however, it's customary to omit the vowels. So, it will be written CVR in modern standard Arabic. In this case, the vowels are merely implied. It relies on you to fill in the gaps on your own to come up with the correct word based on context. This makes learning Arabic more difficult in the beginning. But once you become proficient, it will be like reading in shorthand. Let's see what it would look like in Arabic. Take the verb for go in Arabic. Classical Arabic will be written like this. In pronounced, ذهب. Modern Standard Arabic, however, would remove the vowels, so it would appear like this, and be pronounced ذهب. 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 Vowel text appear in the Quran. They are also used though with less consistency, in other religious texts, in classical poetry, in books for children, in foreign learners, and occasionally in complex texts to avoid ambiguity. Modern Standard Arabic is used everywhere else, meaning it's much more common. So most of the time, the vowels would not be written at all. The writing style of Arabic may require some getting used to because unlike English and other Western languages, Arabic is written in the opposite direction from right to left. So, using the previous example, ذهب. The goes first, followed by ه and then ب. While words are written from right to left, numerals are written from left to right instead. So, please keep that in mind. Okay. Now that you know that Arabic is written from right to left, let's talk a bit about the different forms of a letter. As you can see, Arabic is written in cursive. Unlike English, writing cursive in Arabic is not optional. It is always written this way, where letters within a word connect from one to the next. Each letter is written differently depending on their position within a word. A letter can exhibit up to four distinct forms. Initial, medial, final, or isolated. Take the letter B, for example. This letter is written in the initial form. When it's the first letter in a word, it'll be written like this. B. 
بيضا. It'll be written in the medial form when it's wedged between two other letters. باء انطباع. It'll be written in the final form when it's the last letter in a word. باء واجب. And when the letter stands alone, it'll be written using the isolated form. باء Well done. Now, let's end this lesson by recapping what we've learned. In this lesson, you learned that there are 28 letters in the Arabic alphabet. Three of them are vowels and the rest are consonants. Texts using classical Arabic are voweled, but more commonly, everyday Arabic is written using modern standard Arabic, which nearly always has them omitted. You also learned that Arabic is written from right to left, and that there are four forms of a letter, the initial, medial, final, and isolated. Hi everyone! Do you know the 1,000 most useful phrases in Arabic? In this lesson, you'll be able to know all of them. So sit back, relax, and have a cup of tea as you listen and learn. Aynal Hammam Udran Muzhel Ladaya Hajj Bikam Hatha Ma Hatha Shukran Hakan Halyum Kinoka and Tortini Hosp هل خدمة الواي فاي مجانية؟ أحساب لو سمحت، هل لديك أي توصيات؟ يمكن أن أجرب هذا؟ You just learned the 1,000 most useful phrases in Arabic. And if you're interested in learning more, try learning the core 2,000 word list. With this, you'll understand 95% of the language, and best of all, this is not a joke. Check out the description below and go to ArabicPod101.com now. See you next time. Hi everybody, this is Nora. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, how different is modern standard Arabic from Arabic dialects? And how different are dialects from each other? Greetings are one of the things we learn first when we learn a new language. But how different are greetings, for example, from modern standard Arabic to other Arabic dialects, and from one Arabic dialect to another? Let's see some examples of the difference in some greetings. Hello, how are you? Marhaban, kaifa haluk? Hi, zayak. مرحبا كيفك؟ Good بخير كويس منيح Now let's see an example of a sentence like What's your name? in modern standard Arabic and in different dialects. What's your name? ما اسمك؟ اسمك ايه؟ شو اسمك؟ Here's another example. How old are you? كم عمرك؟ عندك كم سنة؟ to change a noun from indefinite to definite, you add an article that is basically like the in English. There is a difference in the pronunciation in different Arabic dialects. Let's see the word the love as an example. Al-hub. 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 Notice the difference between al and il. These are basic examples of differences between modern standard Arabic and two different Arabic dialects. Did you know that on our website, ArabicPod101.com, you can learn Modern Standard Arabic, Egyptian Arabic, and Moroccan Arabic? Check out our website for more information. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below, and I will see you in the next episode. Salam! Hi everybody, I'm Perihan from ArabicPod101.com. Do you know what monsters Egyptian people are scared of? In this lesson, you will learn about three monsters in Egypt. Let's start with the most popular monster, Gin. Gin. They are the monsters concealed from our senses. A Gin is a shape-shifting spirit or a genie. Not all Gins are evil, and some like humans. They have freedom of choice. Some live in cemeteries and can possess humans. Like animals, they attack if they sense fear. That sounds pretty scary, right?
you might have heard of the next monster. The next one is Abu Regle Maslucha. Abu Regle Maslucha. This can be translated as the man with a burnt leg. The Abu Maslucha is a terrifying boogeyman that scares naughty children. Misbehaving children get sent to Abu Regle Maslucha by their parents. He takes the kids to cook and eat them. He has burns because he was disobedient to his parents. Okay, here is the last monster. Inna Deha. Inna Deha. Have you heard of this one? It can be translated as the caller. The Nadaha is a beautiful but scary sea nymph. And Nadaha is a gorgeous female spirit with long black hair. She appears to men by walking by the Nile, hypnotizes them, and calls them to a watery death. Let's wrap up this lesson by recapping what we've learned. Listen to the names of each monster and repeat after me. Jin Gin Gin A man with a burnt leg Abu Rigla Maslucha Abu Regle Maslucha The Caller in Nadeha in Nadeha Well done! Did you know that Egyptians do not celebrate Halloween? It's considered a pagan festival and is therefore not encouraged by Islam. And that's it! You just learned about three of the scariest monsters in Egypt. Now, learn Arabic twice as fast by downloading all your PDF cheat sheets, including survival phrases, pickup lines, business etiquette, and more. Check out the description below and go to ArabicPod101.com now. I'll see you next time. Ma salema. You will learn about three scary monsters in Egypt. Okay. One, me. <laughs> <laughs>
Now you can say thank you, excuse me, and sorry in Arabic. Let's move on. Asking where something is is an incredibly important and useful phrase to learn. You're going to need this when asking where the bathroom, the train station, or where the hotel is. To ask where something is, put where first. Aina. And then add the name of the place or location. For example, if you want to ask, where is the bathroom? Aina al -hammam. Do you remember emphatic consonants in Arabic? We talked about it briefly in lesson two on pronunciation. The letter ha is pronounced deep in the throat. Ha. This sound is pronounced very deep in the throat. You want to make an H sound, but with the throat constricted a little. Ha. One trick to produce this sound is to push your tongue as far back in your mouth as you can and then say the word hot. It should help you to pronounce this sound. Ha. One last time. Ha. al -hammam. Ayn al -hammam. Try saying the complete sentence. Ayn al -hammam. Once more. Ayn al -hammam. Well done! Now, if you wanted to ask where the train station is in Arabic, it'll be... Aina mahattat al-qitar? Aina mahattat al-qitar? Repeat it again. Aina mahattat al-qitar? So, you can ask where something is simply by saying... Aina. And then adding the name of the place or location. So, if the word for hotel is... Fundukun. How would you ask, where is the hotel, in Arabic? First, you would say, Aina. Then add, hotel. Fundukun. Fundukun. Funduku Mariot al-Qahira. Funduku Mariot al-Qahira. Convenience store, in Arabic, is, Bakalatun. Where is the convenience store, would be, Aina al-Bakala. Aina al-Bakala. Repeat it one last time. Aina al-Bakala. You can ask where anything is in Arabic by saying Aina and then adding the place or location. In this final lesson, you learned how to say thank you, excuse me, sorry, and to ask where something is in Arabic. And in this series, we introduced you to the basics of Arabic pronunciation, grammar, writing, and more. Let's conclude with some parting advice from Yafa and listen to some of her tips on how to learn Arabic from a native Arabic perspective. The best way to learn Arabic, particularly if you want to improve your communication skills, is to watch and study contemporary Arabic videos. That's because we often use expressions that aren't necessarily introduced in grammar textbooks. I believe that listening to Arabic music is one of the easiest ways to immerse yourself and to learn Arabic. Additionally, music teaches you all sorts of things, including cultural expressions and the values of a community. You get to learn much more than just the language. Finally, watching contemporary videos such as our video here at arabicpod101.com will ensure that you are learning real, applicable Arabic in the fastest and most effective way. You are sitting on a bus that is about to arrive at the next bus stop. Suddenly, a signal lights up. What does the signal mean? What does the signal mean? The signal reads, please stay seated until the bus stops. نرجو الانتظار حتى يتوقف البس تماما.
Hi everyone, welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, where is Arabic and its variety spoken? There are many different definitions of the Middle East. Some say from Morocco to Iran, some exclude Iran and Turkey, some exclude Morocco, and some even exclude North Africa. I guess the borders of the Middle East are vague, and not everyone agrees on them. That's why in our lessons we like to use the term Arabic-speaking countries, or Arab world, instead. That's because we're concerned with Arabic as a language and with its varieties. In this lesson, we will learn together where exactly these variants of Arabic are spoken. Let's start from left to right, from Africa to Asia. First, we have the Maghreb region, which includes Mauritania, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. Again, not everyone agrees on the definition of the Maghreb region, so opinions may vary slightly. Arabic spoken in the Arab Maghreb region is characterized by infusing a lot of French vocabulary and grammar with Arabic and Berber languages. Many other languages are spoken as first languages in this region, like Tamazid varieties and French. Next, we have Egypt and Sudan, where the dialect widely known as Egyptian Arabic is spoken. It's a dialect of Arabic with a lot of ancient Egyptian, Latin, Turkish, French, and English influence. It's a popular dialect in the Arab world due to the popularity of Egyptian music and shows. Other languages are also spoken in this region like Nubian in northern Sudan and southern Egypt. Arabic variants are also spoken in other African countries like Djibouti, Somalia, Eritrea, Tanzania, Chad, and Comoros. Next, let's move on to Asia. Let's take a look at the Levantine region. This includes Palestine, Israel, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. Keep in mind that not all Levantine dialects are the same, though. The Gaza Strip region, for example, has some Egyptian influence. Lebanese Arabic has lots of French loanwords. Syrian Arabic has many Turkish loanwords, and so on. However, for the most part, they're mutually intelligible. Next, we have the Gulf region dialects which are spoken in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Oman, Kuwait, UAE, Qatar, and Yemen. The dialects of this region and the Levantine region are considered the closest to modern standard Arabic. There are still quite a few differences though. Dialects vary widely in this region, with lots of sub-dialects depending on the city or the region. I remember listening to a friend from Sana'a talk to his friend on the phone, and I understood absolutely nothing from that two-minute conversation. Luckily, my friends from Sana'a talk to me in Egyptian Arabic so that we can understand each other. Lastly, we have Iraq, in the far east end of the Arab world. Here, Iraqi Arabic, commonly known as Baghdad Arabic, is spoken. This dialect has Turkish, Persian, Kurdish, and Aramaic influences. The interesting thing about the Arab world is the diaglossia, meaning that people use different languages depending on the situation. As a result of this diaglossia, the news of most of these countries is in modern standard Arabic. But if you walk in the streets or make friends in any of these countries, you won't hear anybody speaking modern standard Arabic. Instead, they use their own dialects. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Hi everyone, I am Pirhan and this is 10 Must Know Autumn Vocabulary. Let's get started. Sweater. 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 And in, in English, it's sweater. <laughs> wow. You can also say uh, jacket. Uh, for example, you can say El sweater el ahmar hayli ala lipsak. The red sweater matches your clothes. You can say also jacket el ahmar hayli ala lipsak. Usually, we use jacket more than sweater. Bitmattar. Rainy. Bitmattar. Rainy. For example, you can say El dunya dluati bitmattar. It's raining now. Or if you want to say it's about to rain, you can say الدنيا شكلها تمطر هوا Windy هوا Windy هوا also means air For example, you can say النهاردة الجو هوا Today it's windy You can also say النهاردة الجو هوا قوي Today it's very windy <laughs> There's like a new song like هوا 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 She saw like uh, the guy she has a crush on and she was like Oh هوا هوا It's so funny Bird cold برد cold for example you can say امبارح الجو كان برد قوي yesterday the weather was so cold 
You can also say سائع. It also means cold. And you can say امبارح الجو كان ساعه قوي. Uh, برد also means cold as in catching cold. So for example you can say الأسبوع اللي فات كله كان عندي برد. Last week I had a cold. الخريف autumn. الخريف autumn. For example you can say الخريف ابتدى. Autumn started. السحاب clouds. السحاب which means clouds. For example you can say السحاب كتير قوي. There are so many clouds. Or for example, you can say, السحابة دي شكلها عامل زي الحصان. This cloud looks like a horse, and so on. For example, قميص بكم. Long sleeved shirt. قميص بكم. Long sleeved shirt. For example, you can say, الراجل اللي لابس قميص بكم هو صاحب المحل. The man in a long sleeved shirt is the owner of the shop. Uh, or for example, you can say, النهاردة الدنيا حر فهشمر كم القميص. Which means, today the weather is so hot, so I'm gonna roll up my sleeves. ورق الشجر, leaves. ورق الشجر, leaves. ورق الشجر means tree leaves. So, ورق means leaves, and شجر means trees. So, tree leaves. For example, you can say, الجنينة مليانة ورق شجر. The garden is full of leaves. Or, ألوان ورق الخريف جميلة جدا. The colors of the autumn leaves are so beautiful. عيد الشكر. Thanksgiving. The next one is عيد الشكر. Thanksgiving. For example, you can say النهاردة بيحتفلوا بعيد الشكر في أمريكا. They are celebrating Thanksgiving in the USA today. مغيمة. Cloudy. مغيمة. Cloudy. For example, you can say الدنيا كانت مغيمة قوي الصبح. It was very cloudy in the morning. You can say الدنيا مغيمة قوي دلوقتي شكلها هتمطر. Today it looks very cloudy. I think it's about to rain. 